Well, good morning. He's 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 somewhat kind of spoiled the uh, the punchline. Not not that it was a spoil. Um, it's a sermon today that you're going to go. What in the world does this have to do with Christmas? This isn't even a Christmas passage. And and I hope by the end of it you'll see that um, you know, like in VBS, the answer is Jesus. And and that I believe this is absolutely a Christmas passage. I believe the uh, like Pastor Steve said to the kids and to all of us that that. The concept of reconciliation unto God is the reason for Advent. So I um, want to give you a little context. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's where we're going to find ourselves today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul finds himself writing now a second letter to the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth, who sometimes gets a bad rap because both of these letters have some difficult stuff in them, also was an extremely blessed church. Um, Paul will also say they have almost every spiritual gift that is found under the Holy Spirit, and, and they, they are giving. They, they have some wonderful things going for them. But in the first letter, Paul has to reprimand them because there's egregious sexual sin going on in the church, and they're not addressing it. And it's of such a nature that he says, even the pagans don't do what this guy's doing, and you guys are ignoring it. And so he kind of scolds them for that. They, of course, deal with it. And then in the second letter, he says he has to go back to them and say, well, he's repented, and that's the goal of discipline. So now you must reconcile this man back to the body. And then he goes on to talk at, at a deeper level about our text today, that reconciliation back to the body is only capable at all because we indeed have been reconciled unto God. Let's pray, and then we'll dig in from there. Father God, we love you so very much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son all year round, Lord, but certainly at this season as the whole world kind of turns their gaze towards him. And Father, I pray that we indeed would turn our gaze towards him this morning. I pray, God, that you would get me out of the way, say only that which you would have me to say, Lord, that you would be the focus. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the uh, fellowship team has told me that lunch will be ready by about two, so I'll let you out by then. And um, that's not funny coming from me, I know. Uh, I really, I, I, can, I can make fun of myself. Ask anybody. So CBS aired a show for about 11 seasons called Undercover Boss. And the concept of this Emmy award-winning show was that presidents and CEOs would leave their corporate offices and, and their kind of high towers, and they would take these low-level remedial jobs working for their own company. They would disguise themselves as these entry-level workers, and then they'd be able to see from the inside what it was like to actually work for their company. You see, they really wanted to learn the employee experience and to judge their company culture from within. It was a hit. Like I said, it won, won a couple of Emmys. It, it had a huge following while it was in its 11 seasons. People loved the idea of the powerful and the wealthy abandoning their power and their wealth to associate with the common man. Now, you see where I'm going with this, obviously. At the end of the day, that's the idea of Advent, isn't it? that God would send his only son, his beloved son, and then he would put on flesh and he would become man. He would be born in a lowly manger. And John would tell us in John chapter 1, verse 14, that he would dwell among us. The actual word in the Greek is tabernacle, that he would tabernacle with us. And the imagery is intentional. If you know your Old Testament, as all you know, early first century Christians would have, of course, you would immediately go back to the time when Israel was in the wilderness. And as they were wandering in the wilderness, they were moving, right? Because God was taking them from fleeing Egypt to where? The promised land. There's a correlation there. I'll let you think on that. And as he was leading them to the promised land, his very presence moved with them. And as they went, they would erect the tabernacle. Now, when they got settled in the promised land, they had the temple because it was a fixed location. But as they were traveling, the tabernacle traveled with them. So the word that John uses in John chapter 1, verse 14, is that God 
sent his son, Jesus, to tabernacle with his people. It's a beautiful picture. And that's what we celebrate during Advent. Now we are going to get to the text. So if you have your Bibles, like I said, first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17, the word of the Lord says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, as we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled unto God. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. My first point today is out of that first verse we read, and it is that we are reconciled as new creations, as new creatures. So your, your, your text may say, if you're looking at something different, I'm in the New King James. We are new creations. What does that mean? Well, Steve just told the kids that prior to this reconciliation, we played with some pretty unsavory characters. Yes, in, in the story of the prodigal son, it is literal pigs, but some of you remember your lost life, and for some of you it wasn't that long ago. And you would really speak up and go, I really was like a pig. I played in filth. And what's more, like pigs, I enjoyed it. And so he says, that has to change about you, and not it has to, it does. The problem isn't that it doesn't change. The problem is, as he tells the Corinthian church here, is that we don't really understand the depths of that change. And I want to look at that a little more closely. So if we see in verse 17 that we are found in Christ, and that's what it says here, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's positional language. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is I'm standing here in Shear Chapel, Shear Church, in Mooresville, and because of that, I'm not in Myrtle Beach. I mean, that's, that's not complicated, right? I am tied to this point right now in this time. I cannot be both here and in Myrtle Beach. That would break the law of non-contradiction that says that A cannot be both A and not A at the same time in the same way. We all took logic in school. Oh, it's been a while. It's been a while. So it says that you can't do both of those things at once. So if I'm here, I can't be there. But this passage says we find ourselves in Christ. And this reality cannot be undone while it's still being accomplished, right? So saints, when will that be accomplished? Well, let's look at that. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So your standing in Christ lasts that long, until the very day of Christ. Or, like the funeral we attended yesterday and the one that we'll attend tomorrow, until you sleep in Christ. So you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, the text says you're a new creation. All those old things that were you have passed away, and now they've become new. Again, the, the idea here, Ezekiel talks about in Ezekiel chapter 36 back in the Old Testament, and he puts it in such a beautiful word picture that it's really almost hard to get it better than old Ezekiel got it. So he says in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments, and you will do them. That's the kind of transformation that's actually taken place in you if you're a believer in Christ. Again, in Christ. In Christ. I challenge you, go through your New Testament. We're about at a new year. Start, start a new Bible reading plan, first of the year. Start in Matthew 1 and get to the New Testament. And look at all the times that the New Testament authors say, in Christ. It's a beautiful kind of word study is what they call that. 
And because we find ourselves in Christ, and again, how does that happen? Just in case there's anyone under the sound of my voice, whether it's here or online, that doesn't understand how that happens, Paul tells us in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's clear that up now. That is how you get in Christ. And then that new creation thing happens. The old heart of stone is removed. You get a heart transplant, and you're given a heart of flesh. So this is the new, re the new creation that we find ourselves being part of in Christ. But it's an individual reality for each of us that are in Christ. And here's, here's the tricky stuff. It's also a corporate reality. It has corporate implications for the broader church. That's church with the big C, by the way, universal church. Corporately, the bride of Christ was experiencing something in that first Advent season many years ago, 2,000 roughly years ago. See, God was setting the stage for what would be Jesus' life, his obedience, what, what theologically is called his active obedience, his, his perfect life where he didn't sin, his ministry, that's his active obedience, theologically speaking. But he was also setting the stage for his death, his suffering, his substitutionary atonement. That theologically is called his passive obedience. He was being acted upon. You didn't know you were going to have a grammar lesson this morning, did you? Active verbs, passive verbs. Some of you are going, oh, too soon. And it was 40 years ago. So if we look at the nativity as the preamble of the rest of the life of Christ, the preamble for the reconciliatory work that will be done, then when Christmas season rolls around, we get to think, Hallelujah, I'm a new creation. And because Jesus came and tabernacled with his people, I get to be reconciled unto God. It's an awesome thing. So we understand that in Christ we are, number two, reconciled unto God. This seems like a very easy next step. It's not a huge leap textually. There are parts of Scripture where one verse to the next, you kind of go, what? And, and they don't seem to connect. This isn't one of those passages. We're new creations. And then he says, now because all things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So if the reality is you're in Christ individually and for the bride of Christ corporately in Christ, then we are reconciled unto God. That's a vertical transaction that's taken place. Romans 5, 1 would say it this way, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We read some of that earlier. Romans 5, 8 is my favorite verse, if you ever ask me. Spoiler for you. Romans 5, 8 is my favorite verse. That while we were still dead in sin, Christ died. I mean, that's, that's, that's the gospel, really, in the smallest nutshell that we could put it in. Paul would say it a bit differently in Ephesians chapter 2 when he says, verses 12 to 16, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now, in Christ, you were who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God and in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Now, what enmity is Paul referring to? Genesis 3, sin, the fall, right? Which means, whose dominion are we under? prior to this transac transaction taking place. Before this vertical transaction takes place and we are reconciled unto God, we're at enmity with God, who is told in Genesis 3 that he will be at enmity with God? The serpent, the devil. You are sons and daughters of your father, the devil. That's a tough thing to digest. 
It's almost Christmas, Corey. Come on. We 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 want it happy. It is happy. There's nothing happier that Christ has come to reconcile us unto God. Hebrews 6 would say it this way, this hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. We'll get to that. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That veil language, again, put your thinking caps on this morning. Let's, Let's tour the Bible a little bit. What's that veil language? What happened at the cross? Remember? When in the temple, when Jesus cries out and says, it is finished, the veil is rent from top to bottom, opening up the holy of holies, giving access to the Father in a way that had never been seen before. The blood of bulls and goats, we'll learn, was never really what saved us. We were waiting for that perfect sacrifice, the blood that really covers sin. But because we have this vertical transaction that takes place and we are reconciled unto God, we are in Christ, guess what else happens? This. All this stuff gets better. Because our vertical transaction took place, we now can have reconciliation horizontally. I said this is a corporate reality for the church. So as we are corporately reconciled unto God, it means that we must reconcile unto each other. Notice I didn't say that we can. The mandate in Scripture is that we must. Where do I see this? Well, Matthew 5. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled, there's that language again, unto your brother and then come and offer your gift. How seriously does God take this whole reconciliation thing? Very, very seriously. He says, I take it so seriously that if you're coming to worship me, yet there's an issue with you and a brother or sister in Christ, just stop. Stop. Go make that right, and then, with them in hand, come to the altar. Why does he say this? Well, because John 13, 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we are reconciled unto God vertically so that one of the outcroppings of that is so that we can be reconciled unto each other horizontally. Search your soul this morning. Search your heart this morning. Many of you won't have to search far, and that includes me to realize there's that name that popped up immediately for many of you, immediately. You hadn't talked in a day or two, or a week or two, or a year or two, or a decade or two. This ought not to be. We are to reconcile unto each other because God has said, I forgave you. I reconciled you unto me. The least you can do is then reconcile one to another. Now I'm just toe-stepping. But how did Christ accomplish this reconciliation? Okay, he provides it. Great. How did he accomplish it? How did he unite a holy God with a corrupted and fallen man? What possible act could be acceptable in God's righteous sight. We're going to skip verse 20. We'll get back to it. That's going to be my final point. Verse 21 tells us what happened, how this transaction took place. I don't want to read it again. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we, my third point is, I mean, this is quick, guys. I'm on my third of four points, and it is five minutes till noon. Mark it down. It's a Christmas miracle. So my third point is that we are reconciled by double imputation. That's how the reconciliation works. 
There's this, and again, this is big theological talk, but I'm going to break it down for you. We are reconciled unto God by double imputation at our house, especially when Charlie was a little bit younger, when she was about three or four, we would go pew, pew, and she would know that pew, pew meant impute. We were going to talk about imputation. She'd go double pew, pew, imputation. It made her little brain remember imputation. That's what it's like growing up in my house. I know you're all excited that when you're four, you get to learn about double imputation. So what is double imputation? Why is that important? Well, it's, it, it started with that thing I talked about in the intro about that tabernacling thing, right? So let's read that verse, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. That's tabernacling, by the way. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did Jesus have the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, in the manger? Yes. How about at five years old? Yeah. Certainly not at 14. Yes. 22? How about at 33? As the final few drops of his blood poured out. Did he have it then? So we see here that in Christ, there's, there's those words again, in Christ, he was bearing something for us. He tells Nicodemus when Nicodemus comes by night to talk with him, he tells him in John 3, it's a pretty famous verse, I think it's somewhere around 16, he tells Nicodemus this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only or only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We often stop there, but I don't want to. I want you to see verse 17, because this gets to the heart of what I'm talking about. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. How did this vertical reconciliation happen? Well, Paul would extrapolate this a little further in Galatians 3, and he would tell us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That's the language he uses. So we have this double imputation that only Christ can give us because his perfect righteousness, and, and this is where it gets into like accounting terms. For all you accountants, all the bean counters in the room, the ones that love the spreadsheets, this is for you. The accounting language that, that, that we're told in Scripture, that there's a balance sheet, and we are so in the red that there's no attempt of ever getting out. The cross is half of that transaction, by the way. In the cross, or at the cross, half of the imputation takes place. He became sin, verse 21, who knew no sin, so our sin debt, that, that in the red, is heaped upon Christ, and he bears it. He shoulders all of it, the anguish of it, the horror of it, the implications that come along with it, which is the father then turns his back on the son, which again, we don't think about nearly enough. The implications of what that means historically, theologically, in eternity, the perfect unity of the Trinity. And now, for the first time in all of ever, before there was time, the Father can't look on the Son because of this transaction that I'm speaking of, that all of our sin debt is placed upon him. And that brings the balance sheet from red, uh, all you accountants help me here, that brings the balance sheet from red to what? To black, to zero. Here's the good news of the Advent season. That's only half of the transaction. I said double pew pew. Double imputation. The first part of it is we impute our sin. God imputes our sin unto Christ, and he bears every drop of it. The second part of the imputation, though, is glorious in and of itself. We go from zero on the balance sheet to innumerable riches. Because what's the rest of verse 21 say? 
that we might become what? The righteousness of Christ. Remember, I said active and passive obedience. So in the passive obedience of Christ, he bears our debt, and he bears that debt until it's dried up, bringing us to zero. In the active obedience of Christ, however, he takes his righteousness and he pours it into our, into our coffers, into our account. And he says, now my father won't not only see your sin debt because I bore it, he'll now see your, you as the righteousness of me. My perfect score, my what, whatever credit is perfect now, 830, 850, whatever it is now, that gets to be yours. But I didn't earn it. You're right. You did not. You had like that 400 or whatever. That's the double imputation of Christ. The writer of Hebrews, I think, puts it in a way that just can't be said almost better. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 and 27, the writer will say, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins, and then the people's. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. And remember, he had no sin of his own to pay for anyway. Peter would say it this way in 1 Peter 3, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, and being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. That's the transaction. That's the vertical transaction of reconciliation unto God. That Christ bore our sin, gave us his righteousness, and now he says, because that transaction took place, transact with each other all the time. Have short accounts. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Remember? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So these covenant blessings of new life in Christ, reconciliation unto God, and now reconciliation unto our brothers and sisters, should give us a desire to see others receiving these same gifts. The unbelievable imputation of Christ's righteousness on our behalf through his active obedience and his bearing of our sin on the cross through his passive obedience should produce within us a burning passion to see Christ's name exalted and his kingdom built on earth. And so it's to this end that finally, number four, we are reconciled to be ambassadors. Okay? Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And of course, we have the Great Commission. I seem to talk about it every time I preach. I went back and listened to some of my sermons. I'm like, man, I talk about the Great Commission a lot. I'm into the Great Commission, apparently. So. We have the Great Commission, which you all know, you know, go into the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations. So how many nations are Christ's? So when Iowa puts up a statue to Satan, what do we do? We, we can't abide it. That's what we do. Because all nations are Christ's. And we smash idols. Ask Josiah or Phineas or a number of other characters, I, I, I don't know, Jesus, who overturned tables. We can't abide it because all nations are Christ's. Paul certainly understood the importance of spreading the good news. We see that throughout his numerous missionary journeys. And even while imprisoned in Rome, he writes the letter to the Ephesians. And he asks the Ephesian saints in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he says, As for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Can you even fathom that Paul was asking for boldness? Is that insane to anyone else? I mean, that's like me getting up here and saying, could you cut my mic up? I feel real quiet today. That's normally not my problem. I'm a fairly outspoken, loud guy. Paul seems like the boldest guy in the room, and he prays for boldness. And please don't miss what he says here. He still carries the moniker of ambassador even there. 
Guys, that's our title. You don't get to lose it. You're an ambassador at your job. You're an ambassador first and foremost to your kids and your spouse. That's the mission field number one, by the way, the home. So you're an ambassador there. You're an ambassador at your work. You're an ambassador to everyone you meet. When you go to lunch, not today because we're here, but well, today, ambassador with each other. You know, but on an average Sunday, when you go to lunch after church, you're an ambassador there. And he says, I'm still an ambassador in chains. I still bear Christ's name. So Advent is the perfect time to be an ambassador, even though you already are one. It's the perfect time to be an ambassador for Christ, to speak boldly as we ought to speak, because so much of the world is already thinking and singing and dwelling on Christ, even the lost. It's what they're doing right now. Yeah, less and less all the time, it seems. But they're still doing it. Sure, if I pulled up Apple Music, I could see all the new albums that just came out at Christmas time of all the new seasonal albums that came out from country artists and rock artists and this artist and that artist. Because they sell, and they may not mean it at all, but truth's truth. Right? The Word of God doesn't return void, as my friend Lori likes to tell me. And so now's the perfect time to remember your ambassadorship to go and tell everybody about this Advent season and that Advent is all about reconciliation. It's all about undercover boss. That the CEO donned the garb of the common man. That he stepped out of the CEO's tower and he came and put on the remedial clothes of the worker and he said, let me see what it's like to be among you. We know they love that story. It won awards. So it's an easy story to tell. And so we get to tell how they can be reconciled unto God. And because of that vertical relationship, they can be reconciled unto others. And as we sang earlier, we get to tell the weary world who's in sin and error pining about the glory of the newborn king. We sang all of that earlier. That's our story. So in closing, are you remembering that you truly are a new creation and the implications of that, what that really means? Are you remembering that you truly, really have been made new and that the Advent child Jesus brought you reconciliation and that reconciliation purchased your transformation? Are you remembering that he expects us, like him, to be ambassadors, bringing reconciliation wherever we go? Are there relationships in your life that you need to leave here and deal with? Because you've been coming to table, and you've been coming to church, and you've been playing church, but God said, mm, stop toying with me. Make your relationships with each other right, and then come worship me. But you don't know what they've done. <laughs> Christ does. And you don't know what you did to him. None of us do, not really. Most importantly, have you been reconciled unto God? Maybe you can't do the horizontal one because you've never done the vertical one. Have you been reconciled unto God? Again, anybody in the room, anybody under the sound of my voice that's watching online, have you yourself been reconciled unto God through the advent of Christ? Has his righteousness been credited to your account in that imputation? Has your sin debt been credited to his? If not, it can be today. And what a Christmas it would be. You would remember it, not just for the rest of your life, but for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in your great love with which you loved us, you sent your son. As we read earlier, that at the right time when all of the earth was pregnant with anticipation, you sent your son to be born of a woman, to be born under the law. And that his righteousness 
upholds us, that his substitutionary atoning death saves us. And Lord, may we not cheapen your reconciliation by not reconciling with each other. Thank you, Christ, that we are ambassadors of yours. And we bear that title where we, whether we bear it well or poorly. Be with us in the next hour as we eat and fellowship. Help us to remember all the wonderful things that makes us family, which indeed we are, in Christ. And it's in his name we pray.